Signori e signore, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zeri di Marimò. My name is Chiara Basso and I am the Communication and Media Strategist here at Casa. Tonight I have the pleasure of introducing another evening dedicated to Forgotten Gems, a series that is part of the literary festival Le Conversazioni, created by Antonio Monda, professor of cinema studies at NYU, author and journalist. Professor Monda will introduce you to the third guest of the season series, Michael Barker, co-president and co-founder of Sony Pictures Classic. I guess he knows a lot about Forgotten Gems. He told me just earlier how many movies he has seen in his life. Uh, this season we had um, already had two guests, Academy Awards and Pulitzer Prize winner pa John Patrick Shanley, the, the screenwriter of Moonstruck, and uh, last week Molly Haskell's film critic. For those who are new to the Forgotten Gems format, Antonio Monda and his guest uh, will each introduce three films to present and discuss worthy of being uh, rediscovered, and they're all accompanied by clips. And at the end of the, this evening, you will find the titles and directors of tonight's movies on our website. And now, please, welcome Antonio Monda and Michael Barker. Buonasera, welcome. Welcome back to Forgotten Gems, Le Conversazioni. I want to thank you all, thank Casa Italiana, and thank Michael Barker. Uh, in particular, for what he did in 30 years now, uh, what he did for American culture is really incredible. What he brought uh, in this country uh, from world cinema is really something that uh, everybody should be feel grateful for. Uh, let me just give you one name, Pedro Almodovar. I think you release all his films in this country. Just one name, but I don't want to add anything else. Also because we have a very rich program. I asked uh, Michael to select three films and I'm happy to say that I didn't know one of them, but I mean, I knew the title, but I didn't, uh, it's The Cardinal, but the other two are my favorite as well. So let's start right away. We'll watch first his first choice, then we, you come to me with my choice, okay? okay? Um, I would like to speak before and after each one. Absolutely. First of all, I'm, I'm really touched that I'm invited because the last time I was here, Isabella Rossellini had her favorites, and the time before, John Torturo had the favorites, so I'm really kind of uh, flummoxed as to why I was chosen to do this. Um, but when I was asked to do this, and I started going through, okay, what are the forgotten films in my life? I realized of what I chose here was a very moving experience because not only did each one of these things that you're going to see greatly influence my life and had a big effect on me, but I realized that the first film, for example, and the second film, the first one I saw when I was nine, and the second film I saw when I was 12. And I realized years later, when I became involved with the motion picture business, I got to know the people that were involved with these films. And uh, the first film is a movie I saw when I was nine. It's called The Cardinal. It's directed by Otto Preminger. I feel that Otto Preminger is one of the great, great directors of all time. Now, a lot of people would laugh at that because at the, at the end of his career, he made all of these kind of big Hollywood, but some people accuse them of being bloated movies based on these big novels, you know. Um, his first film was a masterpiece called Laura, and it holds up now as it did in 1944, and everyone knew he was a masterful director at that time. And then when he became really popular, that's when he made the bigger movies, he took on the legal profession in Anatomy of a Murder, which I think is one of James Stewart's greatest performances. And then he did Exodus, and he did Cardinal, and he did Advise and Consent. And he was a master of the widescreen, which is why I picked this scene and this movie. Let me explain about this movie. Is Otto Preminger uh, left Germany because of Adolf Hitler. And this was the first movie, and it was in 1962, he went back 
to Vienna, where he was originally from. And it is the best section of the movie. And it shows he knows the place. He knows the waltzes. And what this scene really accentuates is how he knows how to use the widescreen. Now, he, he, he prided himself in trying to communicate that he's objective in subjects, whether it's about the church or about politics and so forth. But he wasn't objective at all. It's purposeful he cast a very wooden actor to play the priest because it's obvious when you watch the film as an older person, some of it's passe, but the point is the priest is a bit of a boring guy and, and, and Otto Preminger is commenting on the repressive situation of a priest not being able to enjoy sex or enjoy life and to be so closed in. And in the film, the way that uses the widescreen, where you have a close-up of her face and you see the dancing, it's all movement, the close-up of his face is like stasis behind. Now, the other thing is when you're a nine-year-old boy and your mother takes you on a trip to New York and you go to a reserved seat engagement movie, I think it was the first movie I saw in New York City, visiting New York with my mother, and, and a program was bought, and it was a reserved seat engagement. And I have to tell you, a nine-year-old boy seeing Romy Schneider up <laughs> close, I mean, if you don't know who Romy Schneider is, you should really check her out, because she is one of the major film icons yeah. that is forgotten. I think my daughters have no idea who it's she is. It's quite popular in Europe, but not in this country not at all. Not in this country. Not at all. But <clears throat> this film was actually seen uh, by many people. And a lot of people, it, it's a real forgotten film. It was nominated for six Oscars. John Huston was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Otto Preminger was nominated for Best Director. It was nominated for Cinematographer, Costume Sets, Editing. All of those things. And Otto Preminger was a pro as a, as a producer and a director. His credits were always done by Saul Bass, so they had this incredible artistic touch to them. So that movie had a great effect on me. And also, watching it again, I realized it's the first time I saw Ossie Davis. And when I, and, and there was a whole sequence about the Ku Klux Klan and the South and so forth. And it's a pot boiler, but it really works. And uh, later on, when I moved to New York and had a career in New York, I got to know Ossie Davis. And it was a wonderful thing. And I think it all started when I saw him in that movie. You mentioned the fact that probably nobody uh, celebrated the widescreen, the Cinemascope, sorry, has Otto Preminger. Do you consider that is even superior to Anthony Mann in the use of the Cinemascope? Well, I think it's similar. I, I think Anthony Mann, Otto Preminger, Vincent Minnelli, this is the top. Oh, oh, but then you also have the Asians. You know, it's like you can't beat Kurosawa with high and low and some True. of those other... Uh, the one that's based on Hamlet, uh, Bad Sleep Well. Mm. That's incredible, too. Among the films that uh, Michael brought to this country that is also run by Akira yeah. Kurosawa. Uh, I know a story that I think says a lot about Otto Preminger, not only the great director, but the great producer. When he was shooting Exodus, based on the novel by Leon Uris, he finished the budget. He didn't have any money to complete the film. So he had an idea. He put an ad on the, I think it's Jer Jerusalem Post, the newspaper from Jerusalem, and say, do you want to participate in a film with Paul Newman? You have to pay $3. So basically, the extra paid for being part of the movie. I think it's a genial idea. I guess. You get in trouble for that now. I know. Now we'll be But uh, um, the other thing about Exodus, because Kirk Douglas was such a major movie star, he tends to get all the credit for Dalton Trumbo and breaking the blacklist with Spartacus. But to be honest with you, and it was corrected in the film about Dalton Trumbo where Brian Cranston played Dalton Trumbo, where it was really Otto Preminger and Arthur Krim, my ex-boss at United Artists with Exodus, that was equally if not more important to breaking the blacklist with Gibb putting Dalton Trumbo's name on those titles of Exodus. You say that Laura is a masterpiece, and I totally agree. It's his yeah. first, film, first American film. Yeah. Um, do you think it's his best film? Or did no, I you will tell you something. I have a lot of favorites. There is one I saw when I was 11, 
and it still blows my mind. It's called Bunny Lake is Missing, and it's one of those incredible thrillers, and it still works, even though it's got a few silly things in the plot points. And I that could be my favorite, but then you can't... For and, another series. And then Anatomy of a Murder is also quite remarkable. And I love Advise and Consent, too. So I, I adore this filmmaker. Let's go to my first choice. I want to anticipate that it's a film that was a huge flop. And probably is not his, uh, the author's best film. Actually, it's among his worst film. But I want to celebrate the author anyway. I'm talking about Michael Cimino, and I'm talking about his last film, The Sun Chaser. Mm. In this sequence, you can see all the problems with this film. But there is a bat. It's sentimental. The animation of the bird is quite hopeful. It's a little bit new age at the end. However, it's a courageous, naked, sincere film. The man was completely destroyed in Hollywood. Nobody would even touch him. Uh, he managed to bring this film to Cannes when he got a good critical success. I had the privilege of curating as a retrospective of Michael Cimino in 2001, four years later. He would never direct another film for other 15 years, and then he died. And he told me, uh, it was Francis who didn't give me the award. Francis was Coppola, who was president of the jury. I don't know if it was true or not. But the fact is that the critics were very good. Maybe as a form of respect for Michael Cimino, for his past, Dear Hunter, and uh, partially also Heaven's Gate, which I think is a flawed masterpiece. What I like about this film is what he says. It's about this man who is, uh, at the time we, we called them yuppies. He had everything. A uh, beautiful wife, a rich, uh, he's rich, he has everything, and all of a sudden he's kidnapped by a desperate guy, this man who disappears in the lake. He loses everything, and he, be, be, he understands that he's happier. And it's something that I don't see very much at the movies, in this straightforward, naked, sincere way. Again, the film is flawed. I'm not saying it's a masterpiece, but every time I can say a nice word about Jimino, I'm happy to do it. What do you think about him? Me too. It's a I, desperate story. I had story. the privilege of, yeah. of meeting him in the last couple of years of his life. I was actually at, worked at United Artists when Heaven's Gate was made. And that's where we met Isabel Huppert. And, and we were young pups when we were at UA. And that, whatever you say about that movie, the roller skating sequence One of the greatest, and the yeah. dancing the afterwards, it's incredible. And the thing that you touch upon is Michael Cimino had an emotionalism that always worked. The first movie I saw of his, and I was in college, was Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt. And, Thunderbolt. and James, Jeff Bridges gives a major performance in that film. And his death in the film has the emotionalism you speak about. And it was always in all of his movies. So watch this film and watch even more the other films by Cimino. <laughs> Let's go now to his second film, which is a film that I really, really, really like. Mine? Yes. Oh, no, I don't want to show that yet. Oh, okay. I, I, I want to talk, set it up, if I okay. can. Okay, it's a first. Okay. okay. Oh, no, that's going to be the last one. Okay. Oh, let, can we go to the second one, the one, can I say the title? Yeah, it's called The Chase. The Chase. Can we go to The Chase? Yeah, don't While, put it up yet, though. Introduction. I want to talk about yeah. it. When I was a child, I lived on an American army base in Nuremberg, Germany. And I would go to the movie theater with my dad almost every night, and there would be the GIs would be in there. And a lot of those GIs were uh, soldiers that went to Vietnam. They, they came for training before they went on to Vietnam. And um, this movie had such a powerful effect on me. The scene you're going to see still has this effect on me and a lot of people. Now. This film was directed by Arthur Penn, who is a major stage director and filmmaker. And Miracle Worker was a big hit for him. And the producer was a guy named Sam Spiegel. And his previous movies that he'd made with Colum produced with Columbia were Bridge on the River Kwai, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, before that was On the Waterfront, okay? And 
Sam Spiegel had this idea with Arthur Penn, they were going to create another masterpiece. And this masterpiece would reflect all the problems in American culture and American South. And they hired um, Horton Foote, wrote a novel and a play, and, and they hired Lillian Hellman to write the screenplay. Major writer. This movie was top heavy with movie stars, old and new. It starred Marlon Brando as the sheriff. It had uh, a young Jane Fonda in a very sexual role, a young Robert Redford looking as handsome as ever. There was Robert Duvall, and there was Angie Dickinson. The cast was, was incredible. Arthur Penn was in a real down mood because of what was happening in America. He, he was caught up in the anti-Vietnam protest, but this was before the big protest. This was 1966. And, and the devastation of the assassination of JFK. Now, this is before Robert Kennedy was assassinated and Martin Luther King. And the assassination of JFK was the seminal moment in all of our lives. I was a kid at the time, this horrific moment. And then two days later, when we sat in our kitchens and watched television and saw Jack Ruby shoot Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, Arthur Penn was so caught up in all of this. And if you knew him, he was a lovely, lovely guy, but he was caught up in issues, you know. Later on, he did Little Big Man. He would, that's a great movie about, you know, the, the plight of uh, uh, indigenous American Indian. And, and um, he was caught up in all of these things. And he didn't give in to Sam Spiegel's whims about making it another Lawrence of Arabia or a Bridge on the River Kwai. He did, he did give in to making it like on the waterfront because the, the, it's a small town in, in Texas and, and the towns, male townspeople beat the hell out of Marlon Brando like he's beaten up and on the waterfront. It's almost a repeat. But it, the film, it, it, Arthur Pan did not want it to be that commercial success. And the film was a disaster. But I have to tell you, you're going to see the end of the film. And um, Robert Redford plays a young man who breaks out of jail. He was, a, he was a, in the reform schools and so forth. Who knows what kind of robbery he committed. And, and he wants to go home. And he goes home. And the whole, all the townspeople here, he's coming. And the, the ex-con is coming. And it's Saturday night. They're all getting drunk. And everyone's got a gun. And it's, it's, he's in obvious danger, and Jane Fonda is his, his uh, wife, uh, ex-wife. And, um, and finally, Marlon Brando uh, gets, it saves him from being killed or lynched by the townspeople and takes him into the jail. And this is the end of the film. And I have to tell you, this, whenever you saw this, like with the GIs or or someone like me, teenagers, they were devastated at the time. And the film was a total flop. Let's watch it. I'm so happy you picked this film. Why do you think it flopped? It was too much you, ahead of the time. Maybe. This last scene so infuriated people. The critics just totally vilified it. And I'll tell you why. Because Arthur Penn made it very clear that Robert Redford was supposed to remind you of John F. Kennedy. And the way the guy kills Robert Redford, that is Jack Ruby killing Lee Harvey Oswald. So Arthur Penn did this confluence of Lee Harvey Oswald and John F. Kennedy as being one and the same. It infuriated everyone. And uh, the people with the film, including Arthur Penn, disowned the movie. But as... When I told Antonio I was thinking about this movie, he said to me, you know that's a masterpiece. And over the years, people like Robin Wood and journalists have written whole books on it that it is a masterpiece of the 60s. And by the way, this was the preparatory film for Arthur Pan because his next film was Bonnie and Bonnie Clyde. Clyde. Yeah. Um, do you like his collaboration with Warren Beatty? He did also Mickey One, 
They have a, he was a great director of actors, I think, among many things. Yeah. yeah. And uh, several actors won, for example, Anne Bancroft won her Oscar with um, Miracle Worker. And uh, Penn is one of those directors that is caught in the middle between two generations of filmmakers because he's not exactly a studio system filmmaker, but he's yeah. not part of the new Hollywood. It's, you know, his best films are in the 60s and very early 70s, I would say. He resented the studios because he, the studios at that time would assign you the editors, and he was so appalled at that, you know. But he's the one that gave Dee Dee Allen the shot to edit all of I didn't know that. his movies. And I remember seeing her before she passed away, and she credited her career to him. Um, let's go now to uh, My Choice, which is uh, directed by another great filmmaker of the same generation, a little bit older maybe. Let's watch it. This is one of the films that uh, occasionally Hollywood makes about Hollywood. Uh, describing how bad it is, and I think glad I don't work for a guy like that. <laughs> <laughs> I the character of the producer of the Mogul, played by Rod Steiger, is loosely based on Harry Cohn, I think, from Columbia Pictures. The film was written by Clifford Odets. I think, together with the Bad and Beautiful by uh, Vincent Minnelli, and of course Sunset Boulevard by Billy Wilder, is one of the great films about Hollywood. It's a little bit stagey. It is based on a play. But I think that it's quite unforgettable the relationship between him, uh, the Mogul, the actor played by the star, played by Jack Palance and his wife, Shelley Winters. And, and it is based on a true story that happened, a blackmail that happened to John Huston, actually. And apparently Louis B. Mayer paid uh, Louis, Louis Parson, was the name, to... To, you know, to cover the news about. I don't know what exactly she wrote or she knew about him. Uh, how do you like Robert Aldrich? Because he's one of the great forgotten heroes of Hollywood, I think. You're not crazy about him. No, I am. I think he's really good. He's, he, but his movies are very dark, and I'm not a dark kind of guy, you know. I, um, he's a very he eclectic made, filmmaker. He made my favorite war movie of all time, which is Attack. Um, with Jack Palance yeah. again, I think it was a couple of years yeah, after this. Afterwards, yeah. And if if you really want to see a great World War II movie, anti-war film, it's a great one. But I think that was based on a play too. Yes, yeah. yes. It's a very he's a very eclectic director. Just to few, give you a few titles, whatever. What happened to Baby Jane? Mm -hmm. uh, the Dirty Dozen, The Last Kiss, and it's it, but. All of a sudden, we don't remember anymore. And my favorite one is uh, The Emperor of the North. Do you remember Lee Marvin? It's, it's Ernest a, Borgman. Yeah. And it's another film that sooner or later I want to I wanna, I wanna screen. Uh, how do you like Jack Palance as an actor? Because Jack Palance is one of a kind. He was really superb. If you watch him in Shane as the bad guy, He's so good. It's just the gestures. It's all. He's just playing, and he's doing great, you know? And how about Rod Steiger? Is he over the top, or is Harry Cohn who was over the top? Rod Steiger here is over the top. Yes. But Rod Steiger in In the Heat of the Night is right on the money. Uh, I think he's perfect even here when he's yeah. a little bit too much. Let's you go. Know, yeah. When you talk about Robert Aldrich, I think that kind of director is passe now because he was just a macho, right wing war kind of guy. And those kind of directors out of Hollywood, I, I don't see them anymore. And there was a lot, they, they brought a lot of skill to the table, you know. I think William Wellman was probably one of those people from World War I. Another underrated and forgotten. Yeah. Great filmmaker. Let's watch now Michael's third and final choice. Okay. You want to say something? One, I want to I, I say it before. I'm not going to say after. This was not in the cards until two months ago. Basically, there was only one individual that is sublimely perfect in the cinema in every way. And his name is Fred Astaire. And um, I remember when I was in college, the first year I was in college, I was a ticket taker at the student union, and they showed uh, That's Entertainment. And every time That's Entertainment showed, they'd have like 
four shows a day. I would go in 14 minutes in, and it would be him dancing uh, with Eleanor Powell, and, and every time it showed, there was applause. There was, and it was a staggering dance routine. Years later, um, there's a movie called Blue Skies. It was made in 1946. And Fred Astaire decided he wanted to retire. He was 48. He wanted to retire. And he did a song called Putting on the Ritz in Blue Skies. If you really want to see that and the, and the Nicholas Brothers in Stormy Weather are, to me, the two best dancing uh, dance songs in the movies in history. But in Putting on the Ritz, the rest of the movie is terrible. But it is so stellar because Fred Astaire said, if I'm going to retire, I'm going to film this myself. He directed it. He choreographed it. He did everything. And it is an incredible moment, okay? So about when Antonio asked me to do this, and I started just looking through things, there's a Fred Astaire movie I'd never heard of, and it's called Let's Dance. I'm sure it's terrible. But it has one song in it. It was made in 1950. In 1948, uh, Gene Kelly got sick and couldn't do Easter Parade, and he asked Fred Astaire to help Judy Garland out by being in Easter Parade. He came back in Easter Parade. It was a huge hit, and all of a sudden, Fred Astaire wasn't retired anymore, and he was making movies again. But I have a theory that these songs where he danced by himself, he was the ultimate filmmaker, except for the Vincent Minnelli ones, of course. But... Um, in this movie, Let's Dance, we're going to show you two minutes from this song. And what you realize is Fred Astaire, he knew that the film went through the camera 24 frames per second. And he somehow could gauge the, how the rhythm worked with the, when we watch a movie, how long it takes for us to register it in the brain. I think he was that specific. And the other thing that he gained over the years, when he didn't have a partner, if he was dancing with a chair, if he was dancing with a piano, if he was dancing with a lamp, all of a sudden these inanimate objects became totally animate. And he made sure with this, when he's playing the piano, there's no mistake, he's really playing that piano. So well, this song, I don't even know the name of the song, it's from a movie called Let's Dance, and I saw it on YouTube, and I, I emailed Antonio and said, I want to bounce the horse soldiers and put that in there. Let's watch it. Your ride right, is sublime. <laughs> we should all want. give up, right? <laughs> it's quite unusual because the film was made by Paramount. Generally, the great musicals are from MGM and previously by RKO. And the director is Norman MacLeod, uh, maybe his most famous films beside the Marx Brothers is uh, Secret, uh, Secret Life of Walter Mitty, the one with uh, Danny Kaye. Um, this is a typical studio, studio film. And, uh, but I know that you have a little anecdote about Baryshnikov. Why don't you share with us? Mikhail Baryshnikov? Oh, yeah, Baryshnikov. When uh, Baryshnikov's a big fan of Almodovar, so he comes to every premiere. And once I was with him, and I said, uh, what, do you, what do you think of Fred Astaire? Microphone, microphone. What do you think of Fred Astaire? And he said, the best dancer in the 20th century. Better than any ballet dancer, better than Nureyev, better than anyone in any, the best. And he said that when he came to America, they would work all day on their ballet. <laughs> he said they would go home and they would see Fred Astaire on like movies on TV and they felt like they should give up because there was no <laughs> way they were going to match that. Do you like musical in general besides Fred Astaire? Musicals. Do you like musicals? Yes. Uh, I, I particularly like uh, the Manelli ones. You know, one that I love is the French one, uh, French Can Can. The Jean Renoir one. I think it's stunning. And among the Americans, which one is your favorite? Bandwagon is my choice. Bandwagon is your choice? 
and of course singing in the rain. Gosh, I don't know. I haven't thought about top it. hat. <laughs> I no. I think I think I would go with any of the Minnelli ones. I think Vincent Minnelli was magical. Even though there are aspects of American in Paris that don't work, there are aspects that just are gorgeous and. And bandwagon is gorgeous. It's Mickey little, in St. Louis is Oh, gorgeous. wonderful. Yeah. Let's watch now my third and final choice. It's a completely different film. It's by Akira Kurosawa. And it's quite forgotten. It's produced by Steven Spielberg. Let's watch it. I think it's quite moving, the fact that this private, this soldier, refused to accept that he's dead. Not only that, but he cannot accept the fact that the parents will know soon that he's dead. And the film is uh, produced by Steven Spielberg, directed by Akira Kurosawa. It is called Dreams, and it follows the logic of the dreams. There is no real logic. There is no consequence between one dream uh, going to the other. Uh, I don't know how many among you know this film. You might remember Martin Scorsese playing Vincent van Gogh. It sounds strange, but it's true. In the last episode called Crows, you might remember the first episode, which inspired, it sounds absurd as well, the, it's inspired by E.T. The, the opening sequence of E.T. inspired the opening sequence of the first episode. But I think this is by far the best uh, episode called The Tunnel. And it's all about refusing to be dead and still be loyal to, his, to your you know, major or captain, I don't know what it is. Uh, how do you like this film compared to other Kurosawa films? How did you pick this film? How did I? Yeah. I, I found it on, I don't know where, that or my producer. Because you didn't, because I, I was peripherally involved with, that we had the movie before called Ran. Yeah. It's, it, this is a very emotional film for me, Dreams. And uh, Ran was a huge success. And, and the Japanese refused to submit Ran as the Japanese entry because they had a fight with Mr. Kurosawa. And Mr. Kurosawa then insulted the Japanese people, said the Japanese, they are little people. It was not good. <laughs> but, but he came to promote Ran and he... I'm sorry to tell a story about myself, but I... I no, I'm please, so, please. I'm so moved that you picked yeah. this because while he was planning the movie, he came to prom this, Dreams. He was... Um, promoting Ran. And when the Japanese wouldn't submit the film, my business partner and I, Tom Bernard, we promoted him for Best Director and uh, uh, other Oscar nominations, and he was nominated for Best Director. And he, um, he came to the Oscars, and he, he wanted to surround himself with young people, and we were young, you know, we were like 30. And uh, because his wife had passed away, and he was in a kind of depression. He surrounds himself with young people. So he would take us everywhere. So we went to the Oscars, and he gave the Best Picture Oscar with uh, John Huston and Billy Wilder, and Stanley Donan was the producer of the Oscars. And Stanley Donan called me and said, don't tell them he doesn't speak a word of English. We'll teach him how to speak phonetically. So when he said Sidney Pollock instead of Sidney Pollock, we almost... We almost had a cardiac arrest, but but uh, so but at the governor's ball afterwards, we had the table, and that was the first time I'd gone to the Oscars, and it was like wow, you know, we're sitting here with Kira Kurosawa. Steven Spielberg came up to him, and Steven Spielberg came over, and uh, like wow, there's Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, both of them. They came over to the table to pay homage to to Akira. And uh, his son was there. And his son told them that he was having problems getting the money together for dreams because oh. dreams cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It was very expensive, a lot of production design and everything. And, uh, and it was right there that George Lucas was the other guy that produced it too. They both did. And it, they, they committed to him there. And that was just a beautiful thing. And then... And then uh, when the movie was done, and we couldn't take it because it was this really expensive movie. It went to a big studio. Kurosawa, he was just so lovely. I remember 
Mike Medavoy, who was the boss at Orion, called called us up and said uh, and laughed because he got a call from Steven Spielberg who said, "Who the hell is Michael Barker and Tom Bernard?" But Kira Kurosawa says he'll be happy to do the film with us if it's okay with them. <laughs> so I, that's the first time someone major gave me that kind of respect, you know. But the movie I think turned out very well. And what I remember is the world premiere in Cannes, and Kurosawa invited us to be with him, which was great. He, and uh, at, it was like the 50th anniversary of Cannes or something. It was a major anniversary of Cannes. They invited every major director on the stage with Kurosawa. And there were literally 100 top directors of the world there to celebrate Kurosawa because it, it was in the later years of his life. It was remarkable. Do you agree with me? It's a great film. It's a great film. And this one is... This, this the is the best of episode. The rest story is even better. Yeah. And you uh, see the entire battalion of soldiers at the end. Yes. And you know, all, well, Kurosawa, he, he, before he wrote the scripts, he was a, a painter, and he used watercolors to, to... He did watercolors of every scene of his movies, and that's how he sold the movies. Like... When we had Ran, he would come to us with this book of all these watercolors he did, and then he'd give the script, you know? And he gave me three of those books of uh, dreams. I'm very envious. And uh, one of them I gave to Gerard Depardieu. I wish I hadn't done that, but <laughs> I was young. <laughs> it's time to go, but first, the tradition is that we have a comic relief, a brief surprise scene for you, for us. Let's watch it. <laughs> That's all, folks. Wow. I love Peter Sellers. He's a comic genius. Yeah. When I was in Rome, I did a retrospective of his films. He goes from Kubrick to this. It's really, really something. Well, it's time to say good night. Come back to Forgotten Gems. It's time to say thank you, Michael Barker. Thank you. And thank you all. Grazie. <laughs>